Negative opportunity is something obviously that's bad. Closing the window is making it smaller. Now, I'm not sure that I created this phrase. However, I don't know who did, and I looked in like famous quotes and I couldn't find it. So if anybody out there knows somebody else came up with the phrase, please let me know and I'll give them the credit. So in the meantime, I'm giving myself the credit. So what it means is if we're treatment planning a case and we're looking at various procedures that we know today that will work, but with special training, with education, specialized implants and instrumentation, we're able to bring a patient to even a higher prognosis. We're actually closing down the window of a negative opportunity. For an example, let's say a patient has large sinuses, but they have pretty good bone in the premaxilla and first premolar region. You may choose to do a more classic all on four type hybrid restoration. And then if they have a big broad smile, you may want to do one, two or three cantilevers. So now you're bringing in a couple of negative possibilities. So by using other methods, other treatment plans, we're actually gonna close the window of the negative opportunity. For all of our colleagues here that went to the University of Pennsylvania, I hope you'll remember the great concepts and thoughts and, and encouragement from Professor Morton Amsterdam. When I went to dental school, I was going to become um, an orthodontist. In the third day of dental school, Professor Amsterdam gave us a lecture and his little booklet called 25 Years Periodontal Prosthesis in Retrospect. The lecture was for several hours and I was completely blown away. I didn't have any dentists in my family and I was like, un I didn't really know that this is possible in dentistry. And my parents had good teeth, my sister had good teeth, so we didn't really have a lot of complex dentistry in our lives. When I saw what was able to be done in dentistry, I said, wow, I'm going to be involved in that. Now, one of the things that Amsterdam told us was, if you don't have enough time to do it right today, will you have enough time to do it over tomorrow? And I often think about that when I want to like bow out. I say, nope, got to do it now. But one of his most popular sayings that we all know is that there's only one correct diagnosis but there are several restorative options. And that's very applicable to the all on more concept, but it's also applicable to our treatments as we're developing the cases for the patients. We may give them a provisional, an indirect conversion, a direct conversion. There are many restorative materials. I go to the lab day at the Chicago Midwinter meeting and they've introduced new materials over the last four or five years. We've incorporated those into our practice and you'll see them shortly in some of our cases. Now, the colleagues in Portugal at the Malo Clinic, they developed a concept called good, better, and best. It's a pretty good idea because you don't overwhelm the patients. Sometimes my patients come in and they know exactly what they want. Others are completely uh, overwhelmed by the choices. So if we give them just the three choices, it's quite nice. And in that, timing is critically important. Some materials you can give the patient immediately. Others, you could give them perhaps after four months because you need the intaglio tissues to heal properly. So what does all on more mean? So I actually told you there's a little trademark and this is the actual trademark from the United States Patent and Trademark Office, Jack T. Krauser. So the word more is a play on words. More rhymes with four. More means a greater or an additional amount. However, it could also be more or less than four. It could be three, four, five, six, X, or X meaning 10. In fact, on these Norris um, seminars, the last couple of weeks, one colleague had X meaning 10, another colleague had X meaning whatever it may be. So how many implants? Well, it actually depends. Why? Well, certain cases have greater requirements. What's on the opposite arch? Is it a double arch case? Um, are we gonna maintain the mandible teeth? 
and make a new uh, upper restoration or reverse. One of the most important factors is the distribution of the implants. So if you're thinking about eliminating negative prognosis, you want to eliminate that are things that are like biomechanical problems. What's the most common biomechanical problem? Cantilevers. Now, when you couple smile zone, cantilever to get into a big smile patient, you may need teeth going back to the first or second molar. And it also depends what's on the opposite arch. So if you need to have first or second molars, and it's a two tooth or two and a half tooth off of the tilted implant for an all on four, you're really not getting the best biomechanical advantage. So it allows us, if we use some of the conventional implants with the Norris system, they're called Tough and Tough TT. And Norris, as many of you know, have zygomatic implants and pterygoid implants, which are unique in the marketplace and are very specifically developed to help us as clinicians. Now, of course, more means more than just one or two prosthetic schemes. Now, why did I say two prosthetic schemes? For years, there was a typical denture conversion. That's a temporary. But in the final, there was a mill titanium with acrylic wrap or a zirconia, either a monolithic or a zirconia with preps and crowns made on top of it. But that's where the good, better, best concept comes in. Today, we have maybe 10 combinations that are possible. So the all on more, like I said, is trademark. We also have an emoji and it has a global salute, this. So if you wanna use it, please use it. And you could find the emoji on your phones very easily. Now, take a look at this slide. This is, for those who don't know, Professor Bronemark, who was the father of osteointegration and who taught me back in the late 1980s the concepts of osteointegration. Osteointegration is the titanium screws forming an intimate bond to the bone at the light microscopic level. Now, for many years, there have been copying systems that have some advances. And today, there's probably hundreds of implants that are around. I did this case 30 years ago on this patient named Sue, and I'll show you her case a little bit later. And the upper case ends up with eight axial implants and a cast um, metal frame that's wrapped with acrylic with denture teeth. It took us 18 months to create this restoration. And in those days, I think her fee might have been close to $50,000. I had to take teeth out send it back to my teammate for the denture for about four months of healing. I put in eight implants, the denture was relined. A few months later, a couple of the implants were loose and rocking. I took them out, let those sockets heal. Place more implants, they worked out okay. Did the second phase, then my teammate restored it. It took 18 months and quite a lot of money. So for many years later, she was wearing a very complicated fixed removal case in the mandible, you'll see that in a few minutes. And it had um, very interesting attachments in the posterior. And over time, it would rock, it got loose, she had some resorption. So she said, you know, what can we do now? But I really can't do another $50,000 case. So we discussed it and we said, you know what? We could deliver what's called an all on four restoration. Now, this colleague over here, for those who do not know, is Dr. Paulo Malo from Portugal. He's a colleague back in the late 90s that was popularizing the all on four concept and followed it very closely at his clinic in Lisbon, Portugal. And they first studied the mandible. They had about five years of success published and they developed some cases in the maxilla. So their, their data is about three or four years behind for the upper versus the lower, but they're showing quite nice stability of the implants, of the cases, of the bone loss over time, minimal and as similar as you see the conventional implants. So it gave us reason to consider this concept. So my current thinking today is we could do these all on four in 
what I call routine cases. But if it's a little bit more advanced, we may need to incorporate other systems. And this is where Norris Medical comes in. And I'll show you how and why. Okie dokie. Ah, this is the textbook that Nikki mentioned earlier. Dental implants, the art and sciences. It's from Saunders, which is an Elsevier uh, company. Notice on the cover, it's an all on four x-ray. These are my coworkers on the textbook. We all wrote chapters and we had quite a few other guest authors. Some of them are listed here. Now, I'm very impressed and proud that these colleagues who are very well known in even today's lecture circuits that contributed works in our textbook. So this book was written in or sent to the public in 2011. So we started writing it in 2008 and nine. Now I'm the youngest of the four authors. So guess who got voted to create the next edition? Me. So I have a note here. I saw so many beautiful presentations from the colleagues. I'm asking for contributions and they will be considered. Once again, send it to my Gmail and we'll discuss things going. So some of the forward thinking chapters back in 2011, look at the authors, Malo, Thomas Balshi. He's had so many contributions to the literature, it's incredible. Dennis Smiler, who's been my buddy and friend for maybe 30 plus years. We lectured together when there were implants called hydroxyl appetite coating. Ed Bedrosian was actually the first oral surgeon that taught me how to do the zygomatic systems. His uh, method at that time was the slot method and the so-called Brandemark method, which um, was a little bit more complex than what I'm doing today. Chuck Babish, we, I call him Sir Charles. He's a tremendous author and uh, kind of like was our leader for this book. Jack Hahn, he's been involved in, in implant therapy of all types, subperiosteals, using pterygoid plates, mandibular, he has his own line of blade implants, and he has the Han implant system, which is very popular today with the uh, Glidewell company. Joel Rosenlich, he's a fantastic oral surgeon from Connecticut. He's been president of the AID and a great colleague. Uh, Van Doren and his colleagues from Europe wrote fantastic ch uh, chapters. Costas Valavanis from Greece, and there are several more authors. So like I said, we're looking for more authors for the next edition. Now, take a look at this. Right from the textbook, you can even see the pages of the book. Chapter 27 in 2011, so it was written a little bit earlier, Malo, Lopez, and Nobri contributed their chapter on the All on Four concept. So we had this information to us back in the middle and late 2000s. You notice some of these diagrams are quite, or x-rays with diagrams below, are what is now known as the Malo Protocol. Or it's actually the Malo Clinic Protocol. Now, if you've taken any of these kind of courses, you have seen this slide hopefully a hundred times. So I don't really want to bore you on it, but I, I do have a particular point to make. On the on this side of the chart. These were the cases that I was doing for the most early times of my career for about eight to 10 years. They're full bone volume cases or the standard all on four. They may require some bone reduction, but they did not get to what I would call advanced levels. Now I would see patients with advanced bone loss and I try my hardest to figure out where I could squeeze a bone in. Here I was doing some, um, next to the nose, some vomer, and I was trying to do it because I was not then trained with more advanced techniques like pterygoid or zygomatic. Now, it took me time to get to this side of the uh, techniques. So here is the classic Malo. This is me with Malo. I've known him for many years. In fact, I actually knew him before the All On Four because I was doing research at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, and the dean of the school was Malo's uncle, Joao Luis Malo de Abreu. 
And I've met him many years and he told me, oh, you got to see my nephew. He's in Lisbon, he does implants. So we were friendly during the days of uh, doing courses with Nobel BioCare many years ago, even before he got the, the uh, all on four concept. Now his all on four concept is a registered trademark. It's uh, owned now by the Nobel BioCare. So be careful when you use it because it's something that belongs to them. Now, what is the classic Malo protocol? It's a graftless solution. Now, that could mean less grafting or it could mean no grafting. In the typical Malo protocol, it's no grafting. Now, we probably do both, graft less and graft less as two different words in our cases. It is extremely popular and growing like crazy because of the, the demographics, particularly in the United States, we have the so-called baby booming population and it's phenomenal. I know some of my friends in India are seeing cases um, like crazy and it's a fantastic uh, concept to help the patients um, get a more affordable restoration. The time and timing to do these cases is also very interesting. And you'll learn about that as we continue. And I'm a big fan of materials. When I was in dental school, like many of you, you probably were bored in materials like I was. However, today it's very exciting and we can actually see the applicability to using this in our cases. Now, cost to us and fees for our patients. These become routine type of case fees. So we're able to know right at the beginning of the presentation what the fee would be, what the lab bill would be, if you're working with a teammate, what their part of the case would be. And all of these are pretty clear. It's not that much of a mystery. Now, if we look down at the bottom, we have the, the Journal of the American Dental Association. This was one of the first publications of the Malo Group, and it was in 2011. So they had 10 years of cases at that time. And this publication came out around the same time that the book came out. So it's, it's uh, similar in its timing. So in 2013, this is possibly what an all on four case would look like. The upper jaw would receive the four implants, axial tilted, axial tilted. And for aesthetic purposes, the patient may opt for a zirconia with beautiful laboratory work. These could look gorgeous. With average laboratory work, they actually look washed out and horrible. The mandible, as you see, is a milled titanium structure with a wrap acrylic. You might ask, why is that the case? Now, I think it's a good idea to not have same zirconia banging into each other. There are many colleagues today that think it's perfectly fine. I'm of the opinion that a little shock absorption works well. Anyway, this was the type of materials that were available at that time. Now, at that moment, I decided, you know, it's time for me to take more training. Training indicates that you have a desire, the time, and the money to seek it and go to the proper sources. So I went to Brazil for a training that's co-sponsored with Norris. And this is Alexander Salvoni. You see in this picture, it's truly over the shoulder training. And I actually took that course twice. The first time, the last case that I did, Dennis Smiler was also a faculty with Dan Rosen. And there's also four excellent Brazilian doctors. So we had eight doctors as students and we had seven well-trained surgeons as our teachers. So Smiler said, you know what, Jack, I'm gonna work with you. And it took me the third day of surgery to actually really understand and get the anatomy. Now here's Smiler, and he was one of our teachers during this Norris series of lectures. And I believe you can look at his lectures on the uh, Norris YouTube chapter. Now Hostlaw has been a friend of mine through the Academy of Perio for many years. And he uh, communicated with me a lot on the uh, pterygoid system. And he's probably one of the most gifted colleagues and knowledgeable on the pterygoid. Also one of our Norris colleagues. 
So the point is, at any age, you have to have the desire, the time, and the will, and the money to go take education. So now, I offer the entire protocol. I even offer more than that, because there's no pterygoids in this protocol, and I've changed my idea to all on more. So here I'm gonna thank many of the Norris team for my advanced training. Now, as I said once before, Norris Academy, look in the, um, the website and the YouTube. These are some of the people that had given us um, webinars over this coronavirus timeframe. Smiler, um, Rami Siev, he's one of the engineers that brilliantly designed the products and he has some fantastic tips on various angles. Put it in the eye or not put it in the eye. Implants over implants, angled implants. So every time I'm doing a zygomatic case, I'm thinking about what he taught. Whole scar, as I mentioned. Paul Petrangaro, buddy of mine for 25, 30 years, is a brilliant periodontist from Chicago. He's doing some tremendous work and has some training. Ramsey Amin, California colleague, amazing work. Dan Rosen is a general dentist. He's doing such amazing work. He's as skilled as any of the surgeons that we know. James, I think it's Jefferson Raja James from India. He gave us several talks, and I'm sorry if I got your name in the incorrect order, but I very much enjoyed your presentations. Then my buddy Luigi Stefanelli, he's from Rome and did beautiful work and even has done the first navigational zygomatic. Um, Vishy Bruman and Arun Garg are buddies of mine from here in Florida and Ruman is in Arizona. And I took my first cadaver course with them. And that's what made me say, yes, I will take training. And they're doing these courses around uh, Miami for cadaver and Ruman does a uh, ob observational course. I think his name is Ahuja, a young oral surgeon from India. He did several courses and his concept was called Tilt and I enjoyed them very much. Bolzani, Colleague from Italy, I enjoyed his. Shlomo Bijan, he did one a couple of weeks ago, it was very nice. And Benjamin did one, and I think he has another one coming up. So I mentioned them because I watched them and I wanna thank them for showing me. So any of the all-ons, whatever number you wanna put in there, the concepts are biomechanically based. What does that mean? In every design, you'll see triangles. You'll see trusses, you'll see struts. And these things allow, from engineering purposes, to give nine times the strength. And that was the brilliant aspect of the mechanics. And you'll see all the triangles in a second. This is Rialto Bridge in Venice, one of my favorite structures. And you see the children on a trip to Europe, totally bored by anything that I saw that looked biomechanical. I put them in front of these structures and they all laugh. But there they weren't laughing. This is one of the images that uh, Dan Holsklaw uses in his presentations. And I love it because it shows the classic anterior posterior relationship. Then it shows the side to side at the anterior, side to side at the posterior. Then it shows the cross arch relationship. Then it shows front to back, front to back. So there's so many different points. It's brilliant. Now, take a post-operative x-ray and get the angles of the implants, and you'll find that if they're done properly, there's a point in the middle of near the top where all the, the angles of the implants actually go. So it ends up sort of in the middle of your head, right in the middle. That's where the trajectory of the implants are. So it's tremendous support. Now, John Brunsky is probably America's uh, most knowledgeable and most well-known bioengineer. Now, I met John back in the 1980s when we were both young guys liking implants, and he's a fantastic friend, and we've known him for many years. So Brunsky, studying this concept of the all-on-4, he did a series of in vivo studies with his transducers, and he wanted to verify whether it's possible to have 
the correct number of implants at four, or did you need five? He looked at AP spread, he looked at cantilevers, and he studied the maxillary and the mandibular sites. Now, these articles are in the literature, and it kind of gave us a, a good foundational aspect for the tilting of the implants and how many implants would be appropriate. It actually turns out that the number of implants at four, the distribution with tilt and axial, and minimal cantilevers is a process that actually worked out quite nicely. Now, if you look at this situation, he was studying how much cantilever is possible. And you see the right image, that turned out to be about the right amount, the, amount, the dimension from the uh, back implant to the front implant, that would be the maximum load if it was a straight implant. If I go back one, you can see if it was tilted, it's a greater dimension. So take a look at this panoramic. Patient comes in with a typical maxillary arch, some losing teeth, some reasonable teeth. I plotted, if I wanted to end up at first molar, and I wanted to do axial implants, it would be 6.4 and 6.5. Or I could do a sinus graft. However, you see the membrane is a little bit thick, so there's a little sinus pathology there. But if I tilted an implant, it would be 21 millimeters. It's like three times the length. So the bone implant contact is much improved if we use the concept of tilting. The anteriors are, are axial. Sometimes they're tilted as well, but the tilting in the posterior is, is usually uh, appropriate. So here is the biological and biomechanical basis that allows the all on four to work. Now this would be a post-operative view showing the ideal position of the posterior tilted implant. It's just grabbing the mesial aspect of the sinus. You really don't want to go into the sinus, but if you grab that cortical plate of the sinus, you're in good position. So that would be uh, an ideal position. Now we have many prosthetic materials. So what we're proposing is either in zirconia or in the high performance polymers with tremendous laboratory composite work and glazing. There's a lot of new materials that are avail available. So the surgical protocols are advancing and we have a lot more prosthetic choices. Just a moment on guided surgery. In the past, I've actually been one of the earliest Nobel guide instructors. So I certainly like guided surgery, but I'm really not doing what's called fully guided surgery today. Fully guided is the implants would be drilled and placed through the guide sleeves. And these are some of the representations as you're planning your case. Why am I not routinely using guided surgery? Well, I was not really thrilled with the accuracy, the precision versus clinically acceptable. So what do you think is actually clinically acceptable? So if you look at a, a target here, it's actually very precise by the, the shooter, but that's where you want it to go. So it's low accuracy, but high precision. Now, in the literature, there are plenty of studies that talk about, about this. I'll just kind of paraphrase some of the literature. When navigation came out as a concept, it was comparing itself to freehand and comparing itself to a static guide. And, and the skilled navigational colleagues got very similar results and I always typically look at the angular deviation. So if you were getting three degrees angular to nine degrees angular deviation, would you be thinking it was precise or accurate? Certainly it's clinically acceptable. Then more recently there's robotic and I've seen a couple of robotics um, lectures this last few weeks and it's fantastic and amazing 
But the same thing, the accuracy, the precision, and it's all, again, at best about three degrees. So if you're in three degrees, it's fantastic. But it's freehand. If you're really skilled, you can get it under six or seven degrees for sure, five degrees. So these are some of the methods that I've done. Freehand, a model guide, the stereolithic guides. I've worked with colleagues with navigation. I did a Chrome guide with some colleagues in uh, North Carolina. I've observed Easy Goma with Rami Siev, and I've observed robotics. What's going to happen in the future? You young colleagues have a lot of great things to look forward to. Now, this is what I almost always, no, I always use. I use a guide like this. I call it template assisted surgery. I use it for mainly two purposes. It comes off of the wax up that we're intending the case to turn out to be based on our preliminary um, impressions and models and occlusion. I then have a trough on the palatal aspect or the lingual aspect of some mandibular case. And we have a cut for converting this into a bone reduction guide. So it has two purposes. I'll advance and you'll see what I'm talking about. So when we take the coronal material off, I have the incisal, it's fitting on the palate, and then I have this horizontal groove here. And that dimension tells me what my restorative requirements are, known as a restorative space. And it's typically for the products that I use, 12 to 15 millimeters. Some products require more space because they're stackable, and that might be 18 millimeters of space. But if you're at 12, you could do a monolithic zirconia. If you're at 10, you will have some problems with the prosthesis and you might have smile zone problems where at a big smile, the patient may show the uh, end of the prosthesis. So the restorative space is final material specific. Once again, zirconia can be 12 to 15 and the high performance polymers should be 15 to 18. Now, this is how it works on the palatal aspect. The trough is secure, and it allows me to freehand the positions, and my drills won't tilt facially. So it prevents us from poking out through the labial aspect of the case. Further, with the use of the multi-unit abutments, we'll be able to identify the ideal positions and line them up accordingly. So I call this template assisted. It gives me buccal and lingual dimensions, mesial distal dimensions, angulation, of course, the bone reduction property, but I am not telling you it's fully guided. It is not fully guided. And I use these kind of templates on 100% of my cases. So this is the patient that was on the photograph with Professor Bronemark and Paolo Malo. So she was wearing this fixed lower, and you see it has nice attachments. She's losing some bone ridge. This bridge kept on popping off. She was developing recurrent caries. And she said, you know, is there something we could do with implants? We discussed with her the possibility of doing an all on four type of a case. She had excellent bone down here. And we decided, yes, let's do that. So I opened up my incision. I want to always identify the mental foramen on both sides. If it's below the ridge, I can go further back. Then we want to take off the bone reduction, remove the teeth. Right down in here is the foramen. Here's the guide in place. And you can see I have a trough where I could plan the positions of my implants in a template assisted, so yet freehand. So you see the plateau that can be developed with burrs, with saws, with piezos. Um, I routinely use a Fisher burr and then a number eight long surgical burr to smooth the edges and we develop a nice plateau. There are other ways of doing it, not a problem. So 
Here's the posterior tilt. And that's a very nice anterior spread. And with the multi-unit abutments, you see how the prosthetic position comes into place. Now, when I'm placing an implant, I'm typically thinking of a few things. The blood supply, the quality of the bone, and the prosthetic emergence of the prosthetic abutment. And if I get them all lined up, we're going to get a good case surgically and a good case prosthetically. So this case, now I know it's going to be a good case. So we take impressions. We send it to our lab colleague. The next day it comes back on the master cast. And it, this case, it's a titanium with acrylic and teeth from a, a denture type of setup with acrylic wrap. It goes in the next day. Various excursions and bite adjustments are done. Once again, this is a, a, a remake of her case. It's an upper cast metal with um, denture type acrylic and teeth. And she had that for um, 30 plus years already. Here she is at the delivery and you see the restoration in place. And the team on this case was myself doing the surgery. Steve Fida, Prostodonis in Florida, Boca Raton, did the prosthetic work. And you see the lab phase was a series of metal titanium plates welded together. And this was actually a patented design by Mike Peterson, whose lab is in Delaware Beach, Florida, right near our practices. So I'm gonna move along now to show you some other cases in those time periods. Terminal dentition, 2008 maxilla. You see lots of bone loss, long roots, recurring caries, endo failure. Now, I actually did her perio pros maybe 10 years earlier, and she said, you know what? Can we do something else I'm like not interested in redoing as a perio pros? So you see some of the chipping and underneath the tissues is problems. So we call that a terminal dentition. So we open up our flap, we thin the palatal tissues, you see the sockets, we use the bone reduction aspect of the template, I make some horizontal grooves and I smooth it out. These are the teeth and the tissues. And then we place it the next day. Once again, this is at about four weeks. You could still see these are called glycolin sutures. Um, they take about three or four weeks to resorb. A little bit longer down the road at four months. She's looking pretty good. And she looks like a happy patient. Her smile line looks good. And the team is the same. Myself and Fight and um, Mike Peterson. A couple of years later, we look at her post-operative. I like this implant, but you know, what kind of an implant is it? Is it a pterygoid? Is it a tuberosity? Is it a tubero pterygoid? I will tell you that it's really not a pterygoid by the definition that we use today because it really wasn't placed that way. It's distal to the sinus in very nice position. It's clearly in the tuberosity, but perhaps up here, I might be engaging some of the palatine process, but my angles are not typical palatine. We've learned that to do a palatine, a pterygoid, excuse me, pterygoid implant properly, we have to tilt it medial. And this was not tilted that medial. So it's more of a tuberosity design. So this, this gentleman comes in, his teeth are falling all apart and it's a terminal dentition. Oh, wait, I went in the wrong direction. Okay, yeah, so here's his case. No, yeah, that's his case. So his distribution allowed us to do five implants, same kind of a restoration. Down the road, he comes in for restoration check, hygiene check, six years. Everything is doing great. He's a happy camper, smiling. How's your golf game? That's all he does is play golf. He shot an 84 and he's 84 years old. So that's pretty good because I'm shooting 84 and then I move on to the 12th hole. If you know golf, that would be funny. So this gal comes in. It looks to me like 
our lower re restoration is tilted. We studied it and we said, okay, you know, we're not gonna rip out the lower. That was done by some other colleagues, but let's see what we could do to adjust a few things and do her case. She brought in pictures. She's probably 65 when she came in. She brought in pictures of when she was in her 20s. Those kind of patients, I won't call them nut jobs, but they're tricky and you have to like pamper them and you know, work with them as best you can. So same protocol, the template to position my implants, template to position my abutments, thin the palatal flap. I like that, I'm a periodontist, so I'm able to thin the flap typically. Here, I have it thinned, but I also round it out a little bit, sculpt it. I call it grooming, thinning and grooming the flap. I like it to end right at the straight portion of the abutment. Impressions, classical all on four, reasonable all on four, anterior posterior, a tooth and a half, tooth and a little more than a half. That's appropriate with good insertion torque and good ISQ implant stability. Now, notice this. This is the next type of material that we were working with. This is called carbon fiber. I was at a meeting in Italy, and I noticed at a booth this kind of material. So I was talking to the colleagues there, and they said, oh, oh yes, people are using it four, five, six years. It, it works great. And if it wears out or cracks, you redo it, and it's a very long-term and inexpensive material. So for this lady, she also didn't have that much finances. So we're able to give her this, but I think it's about six years old and it has not had any issues. I think I have another view a couple years later. Okay, so we saw her a little bit later and she says, I feel pretty again. Now that's what we want to help our patients achieve. So it makes us happy. And here's her case a few years later. We don't see any bone loss maybe a little bit here, maybe a little bit there. The, the, the ribbon is doing well. The excursions are checked out. She's doing quite nicely. So I was quite surprised, but this was an interesting method. Now, another reason that we did it is one of our lab colleagues that you saw on the previous slide, Bill Lopez, he doesn't have milling equipment, but he's able to do these cases very nicely for us. So, we've started to evolve in our materials. So these are kind of the materials that I've used so far. Zirconia in various forms, polymethyl methylmethacrylate, PMMA, and I believe there are some new versions of PMMA that are long-term PMMAs. Um, Connie Rensberg, a famous lab tech in North Carolina, and I talked about, he has these newer PMMAs that he claims can last for three to four years. And they're very inexpensive. So let's say the patient has, excuse me, my cushion is slipping. Let's say a patient has modest finances. You could give them this three to four year material and with digital techniques, a second one of these can be made, milled and ready in case that point in time comes and it's less than a thousand dollars for us to get two, three, or four of these. So if a patient can only afford, let's say, I don't know, whatever the amount might be, and you wanna give them something fixed, you could give them this and tell them, look, we have duplicates of it in our office. The fee to change it out is modest and you'll be in good shape. Now the Paik family, I love these. That's the actual scientific term of these high performance polymers. They're used in aerospace, in uh, medical, orthopedic, brain surgery, and there's materials called PEAK. We know about PEAK over the years in um, a lot of our plastic parts, the white material is actually PEAK, but there are also other um, part, uh, components made out of PEAK, and the Malo Clinic, working with a company called Juvora, has worked on a, a PEAK frame. Now, it's not originated there, there's some colleagues in uh, England that started the peak frames. Now there's also PEC. The difference between these two are the ketone and the ether. And the PEC 
is a little bit more rigid than the peak. You can take a peak and squeeze it. A peck, you can't. Now, a bio-HPP is a carbon fiber reinforced peak. So it's like in between. Now, PEC, the common name that we might know it is Pecton. And the company Annex Stent in the United States and uh, Sanjus Mateau in Europe are the ones that work with the Pecton material. Some of the studies that I've seen on Pecton show that it has antimicrobial features if the glaze underneath wears out. So we're doing a few cases with the PEC with um, ultra material on top, which I'll mention in a minute. And when we take them off, we want to study the intaglio to see if in fact it's true that the, um, it, it doesn't uh, absorb stain. Now, one of the workhorses that we found for the last three or four years is fiberglass carbon reinforced. It's actually in the um, acrylic family and it's processed and it's cross-linked like fiberglass and it comes in a horseshoe shape, which I don't use, but it comes in blocks that the lab techs can mill and it's called Trilor. And it's a company Harvest and a digital lab they're the suppliers that we have in America. In Europe, you might know a product called Trinia, which is very, very similar in properties, but they're a little bit different. Now, now there are also glass-infused alumina. I don't remember the name of the trade, the trade name, and I'm not using it. Now, nano ceramic is becoming popular. There's some very interesting aspects to it, and there's also some problems with it. I find that it's quite brittle, but it's quite aesthetic. So there's always a give and a take. And the trade name is Crystal Ultra, and it's a millable material. So I'm working closely with my lab colleagues on methods of, they have like many, lab, uh, many mills now. So we're able to send a case to them after surgery. They could set it up digitally, and they could actually look at the superior surface of the frame and get the intaglio surface of the nano ceramic, so it fits perfectly. And if the proper materials are fusing or bonding to each other, and some of them don't bond very well, study this a little bit further, they're able to do a double mill. So it's on two different mills, comes out a couple hours later, boom. So there will be a day that I'll be able to routinely place it on the same day. But at the moment, what we do is we deliver the case to the patient and it's a true final restoration if we do it that way. You cannot, in my opinion, do a zirconia the next day. Why? Zirconia is almost impossible to change the intaglio surface if there's some tissue shrinkage after the surgery. All of these polymers are able to be adjusted quite easily. I've taken them out. I use a roughening burr. I clean it very well. Then I place some glazing material. I put some composite, light cure it, change the contours, glaze it again, boom, changes very nicely. For more, from some larger uh, changes after a year or so, we do take an impression, send it to the lab, and they send back a perfectly fitting restoration. It's I don't know, a few hundred dollars to do it. And it's, the patients just love it. It's cleaned up and it fits perfectly. So it's a very nice upgrade. So these are all the concepts that I've done in our practice. We started a long time ago with the denture conversions. I could give a patient teeth today, teeth in the day, um, the Clear Choice Company in the United States, they do teeth the same day, but it's, it's a very high quality denture that's converted or it's provisional or transitional, whatever you want to call it, so not insulted, but it is not the final. And my thinking is when I used to do those cases with my colleagues, I'd be done, let's say I'm done in two and a half, three hours. They start taking over, it took them in their early days, two hours to do it. 
and they got better, it would take maybe an hour. Some lab colleagues that I've worked with, um, I've done some cases with Thomas Kuhn. He works with Roe Laboratories. He could knock it out in 25 minutes. So you can talk to different labs and they may have geniuses that can do a conversion, but the conversions are good up to a point. If the patient has opposite dentition, you're gonna have problems with crack and breakage. And you sometimes actually can lose an implant because of that. Then I showed you a couple of cases that we did the titanium plates welded with the acrylic wrap. Amazing. Now I probably did more than a hundred of those. Maybe one, now I'm thinking about it, maybe two I can remember had a fracture and it fractured not in the plates. It, a fra it fractured with the acrylic wrapped around the titanium sleeve. An easy fix, not a problem. I showed you the carbon fiber on that case that it was uh, very demanding. Many cases with trilor with acrylic wrap. It, actually, the acrylic we use is called Ivo Base. It's from Ivo Clar, and it's in a, a very interesting system for the labs where it goes in as a liquid. It's processed and pressure wrapped around the frame. It's quite nice. Of course, the various zirconias, then combinations of trilor with ultra, PEC as a mono frame with po uh, preps coming up with ceramic crowns on top, and the PEC with the ultra. The ultra would be a milled, a milled arch. So there, are, like as Mort Amsterdam said, one correct diagnosis, but many restorative options. So this would be an example of a double milled case. So here you could see the trialer underneath, and we've actually tried different shapes to the top. The bulkier you can make it, of course, the stronger it is. But sometimes because of my positioning, it may be more palatable and they can't bulk it up as much. But we've never had any of these fracture. These are like rock solid. Then in the separate mill, this is the material, the nano ceramic called Crystal Ultra, and you see the insertion holes are there, and that fits intimately over the positive aspects of that. So both segments are dry milled, then they, they, they also have similar flex. So that, what, that makes Trilor and Ultra work nicely. Tecton flexes a little bit differently, so we're not 100% positive yet, but we have some early cases going with that. And this is working closely with a lab tech. You're able to get these kinds of materials. And if you plan the timing properly, you're able to get this back in a day. But it's a lot of work at the lab because they have to digitize everything, convert it, copy mill, and they can do it, but it's a little tricky. So when you get a case, you want it to look as pretty as this. Beautiful uh, gingival aspects, shiny teeth, you want the intaglio surface to be without any ridge laps. You want it to be mostly flat. You want the copings to be nice and flat to the ridge. And it must get glazed. It's critically important. I had one done one time from a different lab. They didn't put the glaze on and all of a sudden it absorbed coffee and stains and it was like a nightmare. So. It's very lab intensive if you want to get it the same day, but the next day, it's still lab intensive. I have a good relationship with this lab and I do a lot of cases with them. So they make sure, and we pre-schedule the cases. So they come to pick it up at 1230, boom, like a clock. They're there, they're there. I'm done, they get the case. Goes to the lab, they do all the designs and the, and the digitizing, and it's typically ready for the next afternoon to be inserted. Now, if any of you are athletes and jog or runners, you could run in army boots if you want, but that wouldn't be comfortable and it wouldn't last your body a long time. Or you could wear a nice modern pair of running shoes with all the modern designs and the arch supports and the cushion built into it, or a shock absorbing feature. So, you know, this is where I clash with some of my double arch zirconia guys, because I prefer 
a little shock absorption. You can do one zirconia and something else, I think it's perfect. Two zirconias, I'm a little concerned. So here's some drawings of some shock absorbing and the elasticity. And my patients say, yes, it chews very nicely. It feels good. With that, you see very few chips. I have seen a couple of cracks, but the cracks come from other reasons on the ivo base acrylic teeth situation. It, it's mainly uh, the way they chew. If they're chewing a carrot, I find that the carrot is the worst thing on the planet. I love carrots. When I'm at home watching webinars, I alternate between chocolate covered almonds, pretzels, and carrots. So I feel like I'm doing something good. But I love biting into a carrot, but that creates tremendous force. So if you're a little bit off angle, you could break these, including zirconia. I've seen a whole zirconia frame fracture and they said, oh, all I was doing was eating. So the shock absorption, probably not zirconia, perhaps peak, trilor, trinia, and peck. And I feel that these are more than perhaps, They're probably more than perhaps. So here's a teaching model that I use to show the patients. And you also note that this trilor is slightly different, more rounded than the previous one that I showed you. It turns out that the nano ceramic ultra and the trilor with a bonding material actually form a chemical bond. We know this that makes this pair ideal. The other materials, the chemical properties are a little bit different. So we're still like fiddling around with it. So occasionally, I have a patient, I, I tell the lab colleagues, just make a duplicate of it and we'll cut it in half and we'll study it and we'll see what we think. And again, with close relationship with the labs, we're designing these frames quite nicely. So who is the first person to actually have shock absorption? If you're a historical person, you would know that these are President George Washington, first president of the United States with his denture with carved whale teeth and some wood and some metallic springs. So he had shock absorption and these springs kept it in and that's how he got retention. But we can do better than that. So I'm sorry to show some more of the modern material cases now. This gal comes in, her name is Faye. Very lovely lady and I like was stunned when I saw this. I mean, we are dentists. I mean, like, would any of your patients walk around with this? And it really came in like this, and she had that in the pocket, and she was able to put it in, pull it out, put it in. Anyway, she had what we call issues. So if you take a look at her initial panoramic, you see the teeth are seesaw down here. I'm definitely gonna have to adjust the occlusion. Some of the teeth, I could maybe save one or two teeth, but they're brittle, breaking endos, perio endo, lots of problems. So we decide to do her case, we make a mock-up, and this is critical. Almost every case we make a jig like this, it's to adjust the opposing arch occlusion. And this jig allows me to cut it down to the level of the jig. Then the, the opposite arch that we developed fits right on top. Now, here's a little trick that we were testing when I was working in my open tray phase. Instead of taking GC pattern resin or the uh, red stuff, I can't remember the name right now, you remember it, anyway, we took some orthodontic elastics, not tight, and then we just applied the, um, the acrylic material around that and then picked that up in the open tray concept. So this case, I did the surgery and the prosthetic phase working with a lab tech, Fermin Choi, and he was able to give me a trilor with a crystal ultra, and I think it worked out quite nicely for her. It was a very pleasant smile. 
This is her several months later. She sends me the picture, writes me a letter. This is me at my 60th birthday. I can't thank you enough. I love it, blah, blah, blah. And she also, I told her I was going to Italy to give some lectures. She said, oh, I'll give you the lecture in Italian. So she knows about six languages and she works uh, for one of the major airlines down at Miami. And she works in um, like customer complaints. So she's dealing with people from all over the world and she's quite talented in the languages. So now she's thrilled. So she wrote it to me in Italian and it says the same thing that she's happy. So we were real happy with that. And you see when we blow it up, beautiful lip support, the teeth pop out and it's a beautiful restoration for her. Elizabeth, this is the way she is before. I'm gonna turn on her video. I hope you can hear it. When I eat, I can chew, I can bite. It feels good. It cuts well, I don't have any problems with it at all. It's really an improvement. I don't think I've ever chewed that well in my life actually. No. And the tops, the bottoms are great. And the smile is wonderful. And I'm talking better. The talking wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be. And I love them. <laughs> and you'll be ready for your daughter's wedding? Yes, March 10th. I'll be all set and smiling for all the pictures, which I never thought I would be again. So it's amazing. Thank you. And everybody said how great they look. Everybody. And I'm showing them off to everybody. <laughs> now, that was a couple of years ago. And it's true. She's actually sent us a few patients along the way. Now, she said something very important. She said that she was able to have beautiful pictures for her daughter's wedding. So, you know, you can have simple interviews with the patients and find out what their social and family interests are in changing their dentition and changing their cases. Now, you have to admit, this is a pretty amazing looking um, initial view. This is what probably blew her off from dentistry. Somebody did a, a very beautiful free gingival graft and she probably had a sore palate for too many days and would, became scaredy cat. Anyway, so she's much better today. When I eat, I can Oops, chew, sorry about that. I can bite. If so she, we had to take her along slowly. So we did her upper first, worked out nicely, trilor and nano. Then we did the final and you can see how happy she is. I, I say that she smiles with her eyes. I just love that kind of a picture. And so she's very pleased. Before, after. The team on that case, I did the surgery, Steve Norton, colleague in, um, from the University of Pennsylvania, dental class of mine, and Choi did the prosthetics. So here's Julie. Julie owns a Vietnamese restaurant in our town. And you don't even have to have an x-ray to see that she has an advanced periodontal condition. She has a pleasant smile. So I said, Julie, you have a pleasant smile. And she goes, what are you kidding me? Look at my teeth. I go, no, no. There's this beautiful smile behind your lips. You'll see. Okay. So we did it. So here's our final case. I did the surgery and the prosthetics at Mike Peterson lab. Did the case was a trilor with nano ceramic excursion movements teeth move quite nicely we don't want that to catch or bind the occlusal view and again my implants do not come out in the buckle i have them all in good aesthetic positions where the emergence is here's julie at the end here's a post-operative x-ray and we think her case turned out nicely. She's very pleased with her result. And yes, you can see she did always have a nice smile. Suzanne, she's a like a marathon runner and she's a human resources worker. So she's a little bit um, in the corporate world and she wanted it to be perfect. So in her case, we do what we're actually doing more now, which is a frame try-in with a wax up and once we have the wax up correct and to the patient's preferences, lip support, looking in mirrors, I like this picture. I'm taking a picture of her looking at it through a mirror and looking at it straight on. When we have that, then we go to the final nanoceramic on top. So in the meantime, she's wearing just the provisional. So here's the nanoceramic coming in. 
provisional that was the I think I went from the what I had a provisional then we went wax before we went to that and then we made the final case so we went from the provisional to the final nano and uh, our case was a pecton with um, a nano ceramic on the top our final case pecton with the nano ceramic ultra and th these are the cases I haven't done quite as many as the trilor but we want to see if these are going to be adherent as the uh, trial or the nano. So she's happy. And you notice this wall in the back. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And she has some cool shoes, like Chanel shoes with big clunky heels and soles. So I made her take a picture of it with me. So you see, we, are, we like to do complex work, but we also like to have fun with the patients. So we mentioned several times, there are several types of options and several fees. The most expensive are the ones that are called copy mill, where it could be a nano ceramic over a pecton frame with posts that allow for a ceramic crown. That would be the most expensive. The workhorse in our practice would be trilore and nano ceramic. I'm doing some, but not a lot of zirconia, but in some practices it's the workhorse. And then the routine, probably the ones that were most popular from the Malo group are the titanium bar joined together with a wrap of acrylic. Some people call it a hybrid denture. And they work beautifully as well. So now we get to where does the Norris medical solutions or medical implant come into play? So you see on this graphic, they have conventional implants that are known as the Tuff or the Tuff TT. If you look at this graphic, you see some special implants in the back, pterygoid, and here, zygoma. What's interesting for me is I used to think that zygomatic implants were way in the back, but they're sort of in the second premolar molar and as far forward as canine. So if you need to be further back, you might be able to get a pterygoid, but then you're gonna start changing the angulation and it might end up um, getting closer to the orbit. So that's where the pterygoid comes in as a beautiful implant, as the most posterior implant. So just as a note for the system developed by Norris, is a tremendous array of implant offerings. Small diameter, cortical implants that will be available soon, Tough and the Tough TT, which are, um, I would call them conventional, the workhorse type implants. And of course, the zygomatic and the pterygoid. What first impressed me about the Norris was the design of the pterygoid implant. It looks way different than all the others. It's a little more than 12 millimeters of, um, like let's call it the working end of the implant. And it has, this is the area that's gonna bite into the zygoma. Zygoma is maybe or 10 millimeters thick. So this will be perfectly length. And then it gets to smooth. Why smooth? Because where is it going? It's either going over the sinus, through the sinus, there's nothing gonna grow around it. And then it rests on the crest at the coronal and it's polished metal. I know that you will not get bone growth to polished metal. Now, do, there, there are plenty of studies that if you put an implant on an angle and you press at the coronal aspect, you actually won't get it to move if it's anchored well in the zygomatic aspect. So take some of the models that you've worked with and you really don't get any forces here on a straight occlusal bite forces go down into the zygomatic bone. This is amazing. The multi-unit abutments range from zero to 60 degrees. The other companies that we know go to uh, 30 degrees. Now, you could probably get 30 degrees, but not for all the posterior ones that we're doing. So uh, it's phenomenal. Now, the coronal connection 
is what's known as a beveled hex. Some of the popular systems that have that are Zimmer, Implant Direct, MIS, BioHorizon Company. These have the internal beveled hex design. The Norris is very minutely different. When I put a Norris part on a Norris implant, it has a very positive, definitive seat. I sometimes have to put a Norris multi-unit abutment on one of the other company uh, uh, implants that I might have in the case when I inherited the case to do it. Um, also, I have you know, had other types of systems and I just get the appropriate multi-unit from there. But it has the most versatile zygomatic implants. It's very compatible with a lot of products. So it's very well thought through. And Professor Bronemark used to tell us that there's two aspects to implant systems, hardware and software. The hardware are the designs, the thread patterns, the pitch, the angles, the grooves, coronal grooves, the beveled hexes, the shaft of the zygoma implants, the angulation. These are all hardware, but they all come from the software, the computers, but mainly the brains of the engineers. And uh, Rami Siev and his engineers at Norris have done beautiful work creating this system. So I want to go all the way back to the word more. Let's look at the word three. So these are some slides that I use, and they're from Noble Biocare. So they have their logo on it. Nobel Biocare developed a system called Trefoil, trademark. It's an intermediary product somewhere between a removable four overdenture or a fixed case. So you can give a patient this typically the next day. The system is elegant. It is amazing how it's crafted. If you like, um, those tinker toys that we used to have and erector sets, you would love working with this system. There's a genius abutment 13. So you're not able to do a very atrophic situation. And I believe that's the type of patient that the case was designed for. So I move along and I got confused. I was doing tilted implants for almost 10 years, and now they want to recommend the trifoil with straight up and down implants. Now this case is obviously done by a brilliant clinician. I forgot his name, so I apologize. They're doing you know, zygoma, but on the bottom is this trifoil. So I'm confused and I'm not trying to put it down, but I'm a true believer of tilted implants. So I came up with three final restoration. Trademark, United States of America, Jack Krauser. So what is a three final? Three final, I have two tilted in the mandible and one in the middle. It is not made for maxillary cases. It's just a mandibular case and it works best if it's against an upper denture. So here is a lady that's had edentialism for many, many years. Now, how many 86-year-old hippies do you have that have nose rings? But anyway, she comes in and you could see the flanges of her dentures, the old and the new, how much resorption she has over the years. So she did not have a lot of mandible to work with. So I did three tough TT implants. I think the middle one might have been an eight and the distals were tens. At the angles, I put the Norris multi-units, extremely stable and strong bone. I was able to give her maybe a little bit excessive cantilever, but the trilor is quite strong and she worked out beautifully. So this is the first all on three case that I delivered for this patient the next day. Here's a goofy patient that I did, uh, a Norris all on four in the maxilla. And this is the way I look normally. And I'm sorry, that's the way he looks normally. Here's his case. 
classic all on four case, very nice intaglio, good positioning, strong insertional torque and implant stability quotient. So we're able to get good support. Now we move to the real fun part of what we're doing today, zygomatic implants. So I have to tell you that I learned so much more about zygoma treatment planning and case delivery in the last few weeks following our colleagues with the Norris group. But I have cases now that are a single one on one side, bilateral meaning two on each side, a double on one side, quad two on each side, and I do them freehand. And the guide that I uh, have done wasn't my case, it was done with a team of doctors, but they can be done guided. And the Norris guide is called Easy Goma. So for terminology, typically on a quad case, there's two implants on each side, and there's either an anterior or, or superior implant, and there's a posterior or an inferior implant. So that's how I'll describe them as the posterior or anterior, but they also turn out to be that as well. Now, this guy, Dennis, is referred to me from a good friend of mine who's a chiropractor. He has multiple sclerosis for many years. He has Parkinson's, he has a lot of medical conditions, and he's a very unhappy camper. And let's see if we can help him. You see his dentures are worn out. He hardly can do plaque control. He has various types of extra organisms growing in his mouth. Aha, so we take a look at this initial x-ray. So I said, you know, maybe I could do an implant here, maybe one or two here, piriform rim, maybe here. And then he had a molar back here and I figured I could do one back there. And that would be more classical. And I just didn't feel good. And I'm thinking about my second slide, which was negative opportunity. So if I'm going to do that type of a treatment plan for this guy, I'm building in potential problem and failure. And he also wanted me to do the lower, which I thought was great, because then I could get a much better and sound uh, stability with the occlusion. So I wasn't doing zygoma then. And I was getting ready to do training. So I had a colleague friend of mine in the next county. There are very few people that do zygomatic in our county, in our area. And I did his, I did the lower surgery and prosthetics, but I did the um, maxillary case with him. His name is um, Ed Lippish, oral surgeon. He did the maxillary zygomas for the case, and they were the more classical Nobel biocare technique where he went um, intrasinus. And I think he got a, be a beautiful restoration here. And we have the frame is a titanium bar with the IVO-based wrap acrylic and the lower is a trilor. So this was the last zygomatic case that I referred out. All the other cases in my practice, I am now doing with the help of my colleagues. So this is the way he looks at about 10 days for suture removal. And if you remember yesterday's Dan Holsclaw, Texas two-step, this is what he's talking about with the tails. And, you know, I have tails in my case, but this is Dr. Lippish did a beautiful job with these sinuses. Now, not a criticism, but just a fact. The implants are well done. They're stable, good anterior-posterior spread. In fact, fantastic anterior-posterior spread. But very typically that we see when we do the intrasinus approach, the emergence comes out much more in the palate. And it's just the way it is until we started learning the new techniques. And I tell you, Dennis is happy, but he's not thrilled. So this is George. He seems like he's smiling, but he's all tense. His wife has Alzheimer's. He's a, a cop from a suburb upstate in New York. And he's an ex-Marine. Almost every time he comes in, he wears one of his Marine shirts. And he's a pretty strong guy. So 
he has failing dentition here, three pretty good implants here. And I said to him, I go, look, if I could use your implants, I will. If I can't use your implants, I won't. And I'm going to do more implants. And the fee is the same. So I figured I could get one implant useful maybe here. And if I had to do a zygoma, I would go back here. The other side was terrible. It went to the canine and he had maybe eight or nine millimeters of bone, quite spongy, large sinus. I said, this needs to be a dual a zygoma on that side. So that's the way the skull x-ray looks. You can see big bone loss there. And in this view, I'm, I'm getting better views now here to actually see the, um, the pterygoid aspect. But you see he had pretty nice, thick, zygomatic bone in that area. Once again. So we do his surgery. And what he decided to do here, he had enough uh, restorative space. So I used the front and the back, and I just put a little cover screw on that one. I put two tough implants here. The lower case were four tufts and two zygomatic on this side. So this would be a bilateral or a double zygoma on this side and tough in the front. And again, using the Norris system, you see we're able to put our prosthetic entry points much more appropriately in the palatal aspect so it doesn't hog half the palate. So he was very pleased with that. Still smiling, upper and lower case. We're doing bite adjustments all the time, a little stronger on this side, so we adjust it. But he's been quite happy with this case. So I started looking at what are the advantages of zygomatic implants. Much better anterior posterior spread. We can eliminate the cantilevers, and even more so if we do pterygoid. Tremendous biomechanical strength and advantage. The Norris abutments that go up to 60 degrees bring the cases in ideally. And they're fun. They're fun to do. I used to, I will be honest, the first case I did, when I was done, it was in the training course, I was completely soaking wet. My scrub top and my pants were soaked, including my socks. Now I could do a case and I don't even break a sweat, but it's a lot of fun now. So this lady comes in, Karen. Karen works for our county. She's one of the clerks in the clerk office. She said to me, you're the sixth person I'm visiting and I really don't wanna go away around anymore. I took a week off for vacation and all I did was visit people. And I have a whole bunch of plans. I'm not gonna tell you what um, plan I'm hoping for, but I'm here to see you. Now, this restoration was depressible. When she would open up, it would drop. When she would close, it would sink up. It was up and down, up and down. And you can see she's very sad, apprehensive. Look at her eyes, she's drooping. And she's a very pleasant person, but she's very sad. So I lined up her case and I said, okay, I'll do four anterior implants. She had excellent bone. These are the tough and I'm able to do two zygomas in the back. And we built her final case. Now look at her now. She's like, thrilled, excited. She's like showing off her smile to everybody at the courthouse. And who knows, maybe I'll get a couple of judges from her. But anyway, it was a beautiful case to work with her. And you can see a closer aspect. So let's be a little critical now. I would say that this implant and this one for sure might be a little too superior. So I really probably should have had it coming here because if I have it as the posterior or inferior implant initially, I'm able to, in the future, if these become problematic, have a perfect spot for another implant. Now you'll also note that, look at it from a different perspective. If I was planning this as the anterior implant, 
I probably was a little bit too far down. So while I was thinking of the anterior implant, I'm thinking of Rami telling me, you should put the anterior implant first. So, and there's really no position here for another anterior zygoma. So if I need another one, it'll have to be a little bit tricky coming from below the posterior area. So as I do more of these cases, I'm learning myself. And you see, we landed in the zygomatic bone quite nicely, and it's a fun thing. Judy. Judy comes in with a fixed lower and an upper um, overdenture secured by a beautiful cast restoration with a, a gold fitting intaglio. I'll show you that in a minute. And this case was done about 15 or 18 years ago by her cousin, who she claims uh, is Italian. And he does implants, or used to do implants before he retired, for Pope John Paul. So I said, oh, he was a fantastic dentist, I'm sure if that's correct. Now, she did this repair herself. And she said, isn't it good? At least I got something white to screw over there. So I said, yep, beautiful. I'm able to give you something that you'll like a lot better than that. So we look at her case. There's like almost no bone on any of these implants. The anterior two are not too terrible and tremendous bone loss up here. So I'm saying, look, I'm gonna have to first clean you up. Now let's see what she looks like clinically. Oh, there's the uh, double bar I was talking about. And you see no bone here. So she has this somehow being supported in her mouth. That's what she looks like clinically. Now, it's a little before dinner, but I hope you'll recover before dinner. That is, as Professor Amsterdam said, I would say one diagnosis is advanced diseases. So I'm figuring out what am I gonna do for her? So I said these two are pretty reasonable for her. So I'm gonna cut it here, cut it here, reline it, and then let it heal. So some more views, you can see it's pretty, my child would say it's gross. So I cut it, took it out, cleaned out the sockets, and I wanted her to keep these sutures in for some time, so I chose to use the um, Gore-Tex or Cytoplex cytoplast type suture materials. I did, I did not do any grafting, I just did clean out. Then I smoothed off her bar, I added some soft line material, and I placed it back over this, and it was working out pretty good actually, so I was shocked. We did her case, there's the post-operative, and let's see what it looks like. We got pterygoid here, zygoma here, I think I kept those two in the front as I go on that side. Now, she actually does have a pterygoid back here, but the plotting of the x-ray, I wasn't able to get it in that panoramic view. But you see, there's, those are the two pterygoids, and there's two zygomas here, two pterygoids, and that's a tough, that's a tough, and those are two of our original. Luckily, they, they were, tapered screw vent with the bevel hex, so they were able to be brought back into the occlusion um, with the Norris correction uh, multi-unit abutments. This one, I think, is a little bit too far forward, and we'll see what happens here. And there's her zygoma, pterygoid, pterygoid zygoma. Here's a better view of it, so I was able to get it here. So these were definitely medially angled, not like the much earlier case that I showed you where it was more in the tuberosity. So she went from this to that, and I would say that she's happy camper. So she's smiling, she's happy. I'm gonna take that canine down a little bit, but she thinks it's great. She tells all of her friends. Um, she actually came from two counties away to see us. Now, notice the prosthetic positions, again, don't require that we have 
tremendous material in the palate. So with the help of the multi-unit abutments, we're able to get that in. Now, these are critical views. Looking up into the vestibule, where the zygoma implants come out, you want to make sure you have pretty good tissue. And what you don't want are muscle pulls. So what I do, if a patient having a muscle pull after about six weeks, I'll do a CO2 laser phrenectomy, if you want to call it that, just to remove the muscle pulls. So there she is smiling, happy, and that's a wall that I'll tell you about a little bit later. You like my art? It's for sale. Okay, Marsha comes in. Marsha's very interesting lady. A friend of hers had a zygoma implant that went into her orbit. Now, it, it didn't go into the orbit fat and muscle. It actually caused some issues where she had to have some radical uh, ophthalmologic surgery to fix it and correct it, which it was. So she and her husband were like completely like freaked out when I would talk to them about zygoma, but they knew all about it. So I say, well, you know, you have like miserable bone. You have like almost uh, oral antral fistula from here. You're a bone loss up into the sinus. It's a mess over here. And she had the singular implant done by a friend of mine in California when she lived in California and those two in the mandible. That doctor is a fantastic clinician. So it is not him or the implants. It's obviously her, her, her makeup and her hygiene. And you might think that she's a smoker. So we've been working with her trying to do that. And she has other things wrong with her. She has leg issues and so on. So I'm plotting her out and I'm thinking, you know, I'm definitely not going to be able to anchor anything in this bone. It's grungy. Her sinuses are cloudy. So she needs more sophisticated work. That's what it looks like clinically. And you can see the oral antral fistula here. So we have to sequence her case. So I said to her, I'm going to have to let this heal, clean it up, let it heal. And I really want to do your lower case first to get rid of that. And on top of everything, she says, oh, I have reversal in my financial fortunes. I have limited money. I promise I will do it, but I have to do the upper first. Or that, or that. And I said, all right, I really didn't want to do it. But I said, okay, but you have to stay close to the office for checkups. So here we were able to do the uh, quad zygoma, and I really enjoyed lining them up one above each other. I was enjoying lining them up against her eyeball on the extra oral view, and I enjoyed checking the depth from the thickness of the zygoma in the three basic um, zygomatic angles that Rami Siev taught us um, several years ago, I mean, several months ago. So she got two tufts, a pterygoid, quad zygoma, and I promise I will do that in the near future. And that, that pterygoid, I think, is looking like it's going in the right direction. So here's how she ends up. Much improved. She doesn't have that ugly looking tooth stain on the top. So she went from there to there. And we only see that when she's in her uh, dip, protracted See when she normally smiles. You don't show it, but we will do that soon. So this is Ellen. Ellen comes in with, um, I think she had one or two implants that were, that were in there and a crappy lower removable. And once again, she was only able to have this adjusted for the occlusion, but not redone, which we'll get to eventually. So I was able to do a single zygoma here, and I think it's a much better position on this one. And this slide is for Rami showing that I'm using my various 
instruments to get my angles correct. And uh, Dan Rosen created a uh, Zygoma guide. And I think um, Aruha, Aruja from India has a guide as well. And they're basically bent metals that are able to be positioned. So you see, we got the Zygoma and Dan Holsklaw showed us yesterday, when you get the proper positioning, there's not huge holes in the area. And you see this just went in beautifully and not a lot of bone breakdown or elimination. So her case worked out nicely and she's a happy camper. So this is, I think my next to the last case. This gal is in her middle forties. So it's actually like a tragedy that she comes in with this much bone loss, missing teeth. She's like not working. You can see that the bone is quite thin here. This sinus is okay. This one's a little bit infected. So, but we can help her. That's what we did. Now I did try to do another pterygoid back here, but I couldn't get it medial enough and was not able to achieve it. So I got two tough, two zygomas, one pterygoid, worked out quite nicely for her. Now, some of the post-operative views is the um, pterygoid, looking at good position into the zygoma, good position. So we were happy with the torque and the support in that case. Now, this is the way she looked initially. That's her mother. You see, her mother is much thinner than she is. And we were able to finish it. So wait until you see the next slide. We can really help transform patients' lives. She was miserable. She sat at home, ate marshmallows, wasn't working. She sent this to us about six months after her treatment. And she sent it this way, because I gave her a picture of the way she was originally. This is pre-op, obviously, post-op, and we, we've made her a beautiful person again. So she's very thrilled. This guy comes to me, a friend of mine in town who does a lot of implants. He kind of got exhausted with the patient, and more appropriately, the patient got exhausted with him. So he said, Jack, can you take over the case? And, and he went to a couple of places, but then he went to me. And luckily for my friend, it was very calm down, if you know what I mean. So this is the way it presented. He had a five or six millimeter MIS implant. These were all any ridge by Megagen implants. And he was gonna do a fixed case, that was the plan. Forget about the mandible, the mandible is sort of okay. This implant and these are like different heights. And this bone is about maybe six millimeters of actual bone and they're bumped up into the sinus. So I'm talking to the patient, I go, you know what? You do not have anything for support in the back left area. We are definitely going to have to do implant called zygomatic implant. So you're definitely gonna have to have that. If I could use your other implants, I'll, I will. If I have to take an implant out, I will. Can I put other implants in at the same time? Yes, you will get it done. So I went into this not knowing exactly what I was going to do. So these are the pre-ops. That's the post-ops. So what did I do? That big fat implant was here. It like was wiggling when I uncovered it. There was some imp one implant in the front or two were okay. That one was okay, the one that was high. These two, one I pulled out with a cotton plier when I opened up the flap and the other one fell into the sinus. So I had to actually make a little window and suction it out. So. He ended up with zygoma, zygoma, and some tough in the front, and he's put together the next day. Now that's what it looked like intraoperatively. I was unscrewing these 
just, just, they were like four millimeters in the bone. Now, before I took it out, I put an ISQ reading on them. If it's 43, it unscrews. If it's 55, it's a little on the weak side. The ones that I kept had 78, which is actually pretty good. And that's where the uh, large five diameter MIS was removed. And I'm getting ready to place, that's the, that's the, the uh, MIS spot. So I'm placing the Norris zygomatic implant, resting in the crest appropriately. And when it goes in and hits bottom, you really know that it's solid. So you may recall at the beginning, I showed you those templates that I use all the time. Well, it is. This is what I do every case. And it helps me pick the appropriate multi-unit abutment to get the case lined up properly. So we end up with excellent anterior posterior spread, cross arch support, no cantilevers, and for prosthetic purposes and patient comfort, no positioning here into the palate. So it went from that to this view here, the next day delivery, there to there, and I'm feeling great. So I'm gonna wrap it up with some of my comments on advanced training. I talked to Dennis Smiler and he said, Jack, you gotta come to our course. We have one place left. We have six Japanese colleagues and David Ting from Las Vegas and there's one spot left. I said, all right, I'm gonna do it. He goes, yeah, you're definitely gonna do it. So I came and these Japanese colleagues actually brought their assistants with them. So we had a beautiful course. That's Salvoni, that's Dan Rosen, and we had a fantastic training. At the end of the training, I actually did receive a certificate, even though I thought I didn't pass. And that's Salvoni. And these four guys are young professors at the university with Salvoni's department. So we had eight doctors taking the course. By the way, that's um, Suzuki. He's the head of the ICY now. He's one of the Japanese doctors. These four, plus Salvoni, plus Dan Rosen, and Smiler. That's how many? Four, eight, nine, nine trainers for eight doctors. That's an incredible situation. We had fantastic support at all steps. And it went along. So. You see, he beat me up, I'm kind of tired. So afterwards, I, I heard about a course that was being done on cadaver by Dan Rosen and Dennis Smiler, supported by Norris. And they said, you gotta come, Rami's gonna be there. I said, okay, I actually met Rami once before in Chicago. So I came, this was the most amazing cadaver course. We had cadaver heads, each one had a CT scan and a stereolithic model of the ridge of that cadaver. So when we were doing practice technique, it was the, the actual uh, representation of the case that we were gonna work on in the cadaver lab. So I got a picture with Rami and Dennis and everybody's happy all the time. Along the way, we bump into uh, Holskloy and Rosen. I call them the Dapper Dans, because Rosen was the first guy to teach me about medial and Holsclaw nailed it. Told me, go until you hit the wall, then you know you're in the right spot. If you didn't hit the wall, you're in the wrong spot. So they are my maestros of pterygoid. And I'm coming down the home stretch. So my first mentor actually is my father. Al Krauser is 94. He still lives in Delray Beach, Florida with my mother. And he's, as you see in his hat, a World War II veteran. You see on his jacket, it says the Palm Beach Senior Tennis League. So he's been involved in that. He has been the president. He's been the commissioner. And now he's kind of semi-retired from it. They call him the commissioner emeritus. And when he was working, he was a high school teacher and an athletics coach. He coached football in the fall and indoor and outdoor track and field. His track and field teams actually were quite exemplary. They, they had runs of like 21 years in a row where they won the county championships. Then he lost it by one point 
And then they had another string of like 26 uh, championships in a row. And he would tell his athletes and he would tell me, train hard and do the best you can. And that's all he wanted from his athletes. Now he had over the years, I think 16 high school All-Americans, which means that you were in the top 25 in every event in track and field as represented by track and field news. He had a couple of high school All-Americans and he had one athlete named Willie Smith who actually went on to win three Olympic medals. And he won an event in California called the Golden West. And he was the most outstanding athlete at that event. And he won what was called the Governor's Cup. The governor of California at that time was Ronald Reagan, who we know became president of the United States. So the athlete, Willie, was a little bit nervous when he was going to go up to get the award. So he said to my father, what should I say? So my father said, tell him you won this one for the Gipper. And then Willie said, well, what does that mean? And just and my father said, I'll tell you later. He'll know and he'll laugh. So he went up and then Pre uh, President Reagan and then Governor Reagan shook his hand, fantastic performances. And do you have anything to say? And he goes, yes, I won this one for the Gipper. And Reagan almost fell off the stage laughing. He was hugging him. That was fantastic. So my father had in his classroom, the back wall was called the Wall of Fame. And there were pictures from the local newspapers, the New York Times, because this school was in New York, Newsday and they had the Long Island Press. Um, I had taken tons of pictures, the parents took pictures. And if you did something well, not necessarily all American, you got your picture up on the wall. And there were hundreds of pictures up on the wall. So there were three junior high schools that fed this high school and they would have their annual meet. And my father would go to the meet and every year there would be young kids coming up to him and they would say, oh, Mr. Krauser, I can't wait to run for you. And my goal is I want to get to the wall of fame. So it was like legendary. Even the junior high school kids knew about the wall of fame. So when he retired, some of the pictures he left up there, some of his favorite athletes he dismantled. So now the picture on the right side, I have a large mural in my office. It's the forest and the trees. And we call that our wall of fame. So the patients have seen pictures of other patients at the Wall of Fame. And sort of the, one of their goals is if I say that their case turned out nicely, we'll bring them to the Wall of Fame. And this is Mike Peterson, my lab colleague at the Wall. So here's just a couple of pictures that we've done. People at the Wall of Fame, some of them you've seen, some of them are other cases I didn't show today. And we have nice time with our cases. So. Today is actually Shavuos. It's a religious holiday in the Jewish religion. And it's the holiday in honor of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. Now, this is a statue of Moses in Rome from the great sculptor Michelangelo. Michelangelo was once asked, when you were doing the David and the Moses, what did you do first, the head or the legs? And Michelangelo said something that I think about when I look at my cases. I don't do the foot or the head. I see the finished case and I just got it to that point. I removed the marble and until it got there. So just for the next minute, you'll see something to make you smile before we go to happy hour. Moses went to the mountain and God spoke unto him. to obey my law. Do you hear me? I hear you, I hear you. A deaf man could hear you. What? Nothing, I don't understand, forget it. Oh Lord, why have you chosen me? What would you have me do for you? I shall give you my laws and you shall take them unto the people. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Oh, 
but I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. Oh, he, the Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. Okay, so thank you very much.